Okay, moving along. So, two things. One, uh, there are a decent amount of people standing in the back of the room. So, if you have an open seat next to you, just raise your hand so that people can see where they are. Okay, now they see. They'll make their way over. Thank you very much. This is audience engagement that I've been working on. Uh, please take out your phones. We're going to do another polling question. Ready? Which of the following partnerships deliver the most sustainability impact? Is it those between businesses, business and government, business and nonprofit, nonprofit and government? I think we're going to be flipping over to the results in a second. There we go. Business to business, business to government. We have some interesting, interested spectators over there on the side. All right, so a little bit across the board, but it seems like business to business is, is the perceived winner. But I have a feeling our next panel is going to debunk that belief. <laughs> Here to discuss a new partnership between Syngenta and the Nature Conservancy is Syngenta's CEO, Eric Furwald, and the interim CEO of the Nature Conservancy, Sally Jewell for a conversation with a true on-stage pro, Eric Schatzker. So I'll leave the stage to them. Come on up, fellas. Thanks, Eric. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm not going to spend much time on introductions, so we can get right into it, but I will say that um, sustainability is a growing focus for me, it's a growing focus for my colleagues, and I think you'll see and hear a lot more about it on Bloomberg News, Bloomberg Television, and Bloomberg Radio in the weeks and months to come, so look forward to that. That's, um, welcome, Eric, welcome, Sally. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. That poll was a, a good preface because... <laughs> I think it's fair to say in the discussions and debates over climate change and sustainability, too often you find participants isolated into three camps. They're the companies and business groups, they're the NGOs and the not-for-profits, they're the policymakers and the regulators, and they all mistrust one another equally. Right? The CEOs are happy to keep on raping the planet so long as it delivers shareholder value. The philanthropic crusaders live in an economic fantasy land, and governments are hopelessly incompetent. Of course, that's not <laughs> totally true. What is unusual about this conversation is that we have representatives from two of those camps, and they've decided to work together in the pursuit of sustainable agriculture. Syngenta is among the world's largest producers of crop chemicals and seeds, and the Nature Conservancy is America's top-ranked environmental charity by donor support and also by revenue. So we have two key players in this arena. You formed a partnership. Sally, tell us, what is the partnership? And more importantly, how's it going to work? Well, it's a very important partnership, and I think mm -hmm. it actually uh, was formed out of a conversation between Eric and my predecessor, Mark Tursik, at the World Economic Forum. Is that right? Correct. Um, and one of the biggest challenges that we have to our planet, particularly around climate change and sequestering carbon and uh, Clean water uh, is deforestation, uh, deforestation of places like the Amazon, which of course is in the news, but also in other places like the Cerrado in Brazil, um, the wiping out of uh, habitat that's critical, critical for native species and pollinators in the United States in what, uh, when I was in government, we used to call the brown deserts of, uh, of, the, uh, of kind of the ag belt in the Midwest in the country. And... So how do you have impact at scale? And the answer is you do that through partnerships. So in the case of Syngenta and the Nature Conservancy, it's about working together to say, could a large agribusiness company and a nonprofit work together to identify ways to reduce deforestation by increasing crop yields? Can we take denuded landscapes that have been over-farmed, where those farmers may be now clearing rainforest to take those nutrients out of the soil and instead regain those nutrients and regain the carbon in the soil so that the deforestation doesn't have to occur. And this was the beginning of a relationship, which is actually now a few years old, and Syngenta has been supporting 
the Nature Conservancy's science to validate this on the ground and to figure out what's actually working uh, so that we're learning from each other. And I think it's been, uh, it's been a great partnership so far. And Eric, what's in it for you? Well, I think there's fantastic opportunity. For, for, first of all, climate change is putting enormous pressure on farmers and agriculture globally. I mean, just take a look at this year. This year in the United States was the worst flooding in, a, in by far the largest part of agriculture across the company, across the country in history. You know, we talk a lot about five-year floods, 10-year floods, 50-year floods. This was the worst flooding in history. It really started raining last fall and didn't stop raining until June. And farmers normally plant in April or early May. Many farmers didn't plant until late June into July. Unprecedented. And many farmers didn't plant. At the same time, Australia, another big agriculture country, has the worst drought in history. And at the same time, we've got the highest temperatures ever recorded in France and other countries. I mean, farmers and Syngenta, the industry, is facing unprecedented weather extremes. So we have to help, we know we have to help farmers deal with those extremes, but we also have to help farmers, agriculture, be part of the solution to climate change. We have to find a way to, to make the agriculture food system reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions, not keep increasing. And today, about 12% of greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture, 25% from the agriculture food chain, we think we can together significantly reduce that. So we're working in a strategic relationship, a strategic partnership with the TNC, but also reaching out to other farmers by project or other partners by project to make sure we've got the right group together to really make a difference, whether it's the US, Brazil, China, or elsewhere in the world. Uh, I just want to mention one thing. Lee instructed you to take out your phones for the purposes of the poll. Keep those phones out because just as you have with past sessions, you can contribute questions and we'll get to those uh, with a few minutes remaining in this session. Um, Eric, people here may not know that this work with the Nature Conservancy is part of a larger commitment to sustainability that Syngenta announced today. There's a $2 billion price tag on it. There's a five-year um, period. Um, this is going to sound like an aggressive question, but I think it's important for the audience to understand why. Why $2 billion? Why five years? When some here may be familiar with the announcement from your competitors only weeks ago at Bayer that they're going to spend 25 billion euros we call it $30 billion <laughs> over 10 years on um, crop science R&D. Well, f first of all, I, I think it used to be that, that we, we talked a little bit about climate change and sustainability off to the side. Now our business is sustainability. We, we, our whole business is agriculture sustainability. So everything we do, everything we invest could be considered to enhance agriculture sustainability. But we've set apart this $2 billion specifically for breakthrough innovation. So breakthrough technologies and breakthrough models. And we'd love to talk about some of those because I think they're the ones that can really change the dynamic. So we, we could you know, gradually reduce the amount of CO2 emissions from agriculture, but we want to make some step changes. And we need partners to do that. And, and, and players like Bayer and Corteva and others we want everybody to be part of this, but we also want it to go all the way to the food company and the consumer, because if the consumer is demanding food that is sustainably grown, that's going to help us set up the farmer and the whole system to meet that consumer desire. When you say your business is sustainability, and this question is really to both of you, is it because, in your case, Eric, you actually believe in it altruistically or is it simply a matter of what you just said that the customer the end customer wants something that's or a growing percentage of the end customer base wants something that is sustainable and if that percentage keeps growing then you'll have no choice but to keep up with it it's both so what, what we've historically done is invested in a lot in R&D for products crop protection products but also seeds that enhance yields. 
So the farmer grows more on less land, which is good for the world. Feed the world and do it on less land. What we're now doing is saying, well, that, that's good, but that's not enough. And, and, and the Nature Conservancy is, is challenging us to, to develop products in our R&D pipeline that not only increase yield, but what's the CO2 impact? Does it result in a, in, in a, in a corn plant that doesn't have to be tilled, the farmer doesn't have mm -hmm. to till, leaves the carbon in the soil? Which, by the way, leaves moisture in the soil so you don't have to irrigate as much. And if you have a drought or higher temperatures ne next year, you'll still get a better crop. So it's not just looking at one element, it's looking at those elements, which has changed our thinking of our, uh, on how we develop products. So we're still doing that, the, the breeding R&D to get better seeds, but we're thinking about how does it impact the environment. Can we develop a seed where it protects itself from disease, where it protects itself from insects? So you don't have to spay, spray crop protection products, so you don't use the energy to go across the field, or you do it less. So this kind of changing our thinking completely, it, it, it's a new model for us. And it, it's challenging for us. We also, by the way, brought onto our board a woman by the name of Louise Fresco, who's the president of Wageningen University, which is one of the leading agriculture universities in the world. And she's a known environmentalist, and she's on our board challenging us. So we're, we're looking for partners with different thinking about h how do we do things differently. Another example, I think this is a really important one, the Nature Conservancy cares deeply about the environment, cares deeply about stopping deforestation as a, as a top priority for the world. We do too. So we've come together in a project called Revert, which is part of where the $2 billion is going to, to go to Brazil, and Brazil has large amounts of land that are de degraded pasture land that are sitting there fallow. So while the Amazon is being deforested for new farmland, as an alternative to that, let's go to these degraded lands together. Which and is as big as the state of Texas. Huge, huge amount of land. So you could stop the deforestation and just focus on, on this, this land. And we figured out how to, to, to develop the right seeds that you can plant in this, in this area. Yeah, the yields are lower. But, but it starts to enrich the soil, and then you, you, you put another crop on it, you, you, you rotate crops, and after five years, it's in full, full production. But for those five years, we need banks to come in and, and, and finance the farming, and, and with our support and with TNC support, this system is going to work. I mean, just, just think of if, if we can work together to do projects like these, and not only stop deforestation, but actually start reforesting mm -hmm. because we're more productive with the land that we have. So what your survey missed a few minutes ago was an all of the above. Business, yes. nonprofit organizations, government, and I would argue universities as well. Yeah. Um, each brings something to the table, and it's going to take all hands on deck. This is not about altruism. This is about the future of our planet. Saving the planet. Saving the planet, saving people, increasing food security, increasing uh, water security, um, keeping those areas that are so critical for carbon sequestration, sequestering carbon, sequestering carbon in producing agricultural lands. And uh, if we don't work together collectively, we're in a world of hurt. Uh, we got ourselves to this point by uh, being uncollaborative, it is time to collaborate. So let me ask you this question because it may be on the minds of people in the audience and people watching from elsewhere. Why collaborate with an industry, I'll call it agribusiness, I'm not specifically pointing fingers at Syngenta, but agribusiness yep. as an industry right, whose products are blamed from everything from water contamination to the loss of biological diversity. And I ask this question in the context of your background. You've served in government. You were the Secretary of the Interior for mm -hmm. four years you know that government pulls the biggest levers of all. Why That's not right. just make this a matter of government regulation and force companies to submit? Well, first let me say my career has been in business. And right before becoming Secretary of the Interior, I was the CEO of REI, the outdoor retailer. Uh, we care deeply about these things. And what's frustrating if you're a business is sometimes the laws don't reward the right behavior, they re reward the wrong behavior. When you can prove up a concept together and you have a validator like the Nature Conservancy, 
working in partnership with an organization like Syngenta, um, you bring a, a, a different mindset. You bring kind of a trust but verify. Um, <laughs> We've got to see results on the ground, and when the Nature Conservancy says, yes, this is really working, it's different than when Syngenta says it. When Syngenta and the Nature Conservancy go to a regulator uh, around, say, the next version of the Farm Bill or otherwise, and say, here are some facts, here's what really works, it's easier for that regulator to do the right thing. Syngenta goes by themselves. It's, oh, we've got to be careful. This is probably just in the business best interest. If we work together... Right. and we can show scientifically based facts on what works, then you can actually align policies that drive the right kinds of outcomes mm. that are good for the planet as well as being good for business. You don't get anywhere when it's just about you know, regulation that hurts business or uh, you know, oversimplified NGO slogans that, um, like GMOs would be one example. It's just far more complex than that. By working together... You can share, and we have done this between TNC and, and Syngenta, you can uh, share a different knowledge base, share different uh, perspectives, and open each other's eyes into solutions that are both uh, economically successful as well as environmentally sustainable. And that's where we need to go. Um, and it's hard to take risk in government. It's much easier to just go with the status quo. What partnerships like this on the outside can do is prove things up on the ground so it's less risky for government to create policies or regulations in support because they actually have facts to back that up, validated often by uh, academia as well. So it's a good example. Your most valuable currency is trust. That's the right. trust of your donors, yep. the trust of the public. What kinds of tests does a company like Syngenta have to pass to earn that trust? Well, transparency, accountability. You know, what our scientists are doing is... Um, coming up with the measures that say, are we increasing soil carbon? Are we uh, reducing deforestation? If we are reforesting certain lands, are we getting the kind of uh, benefit that we think we're getting? And that independent validation is really critical. But the uh, Syngenta has risen their, uh, raised their hand and said, um, we are willing to be held accountable and we are willing to be transparent. And that is absolutely critical to the Nature Conservancy. So we are independent uh, completely. We're helping coming up with the measures. But those measures actually will be validated by an independent third party that's not either Syngenta or TNC um, that will make sure that there's a bright light shined uh, on this work. And I think that's really important. And for other businesses um, that... Transparency and that expectation of transparency will bring more of them to the table because that becomes more of a public expectation. And as Eric was saying, if you're going to move the meter on what people demand in their products, it has to be um, scientifically validated and transparent. And that's a big part of how this relationship will work. Can we talk a bit more about that, Eric? Yeah. Um, one of the biggest obstacles in let's call it the business of sustainability or CSR, um, is this idea, uh, and it's at least the tripartite idea of, you know, transparency, measurement, yes. and reporting. You know, what is it that you're going to measure, or at least to the degree that, that you've right. figured that out? Um, who's going to validate it? And then how are you going to make it available? How are people, again, going back to trust, how is it that you're going to earn their trust? Well, we'll, we'll measure things like CO2 emissions, water use in agriculture, um, land productivity, and, and, and the ability to, to do more farming on less land so that we can protect the forest. But let me give you another example of a great project that we, we, we've been working on together, which includes Kellogg's, the food company, in mm -hmm. the United States. Because it's really important that we go down the value chain. And ultimately, we've got to get to the consumer. Because the, the, the metrics, if the, if the consumer wants to buy products, because they're sustainably grown, that's the ultimate goal here. So we're, we work together with the Nature Conservancy, Syngenta, and uh, Kellogg's, with meat, wheat farmers in the Midwest, including in Michigan. And so what we do is, is we bring the best practices, the best wheat varieties, the best seeds, the best fertilizer, and, and crop protection protocols. We monitor what they do. 
Um, and so we only spray if it's needed. We try to do, do the minimum impact on the, on, the, on the grain. So you get great yields. You've, you, you've, you, after you, you harvest, you leave the crop on the ground after you've harvested what's left on the ground so that the carbon goes into the soil. And we have digital tools to monitor the whole system. And so we know exactly what the CO2 emission was, how much water was used, how much energy was used, and what the yield was, the productivity of the land. And General Mills can compare that, or, or in this case, Kellogg's can compare that to other farmers, and they know that the farmers that they used with these practices had 14% higher yields, had about 27% less CO2 emissions, and used about 22% less water. I mean, that, so, so they know that they're more sustainable. They're buying more sustainable grains into their, into their products. And they show pictures of farmers in, in their stores now with their, with their grains saying, this, this farmer helped grow this product more sustainably here in the United States. And, to, and then ultimately, we keep going with that. So any food company that wants to know that their food was grown sustainably can have the data where it was grown, how it was grown, how that compares to non-sustainably grown food that they would have sourced otherwise. Then ultimately the farmer should get paid more and the whole value chain should be rewarded because the consumer is willing to pay more for environmentally friendly food, just like they do with other things. One other thing that you didn't mention that is also really important is the Gulf of Mexico is in trouble because of the nutrient runoff ultimately into the Mississippi River. It, another measure is using uh, less fertilizer, right. which then is less potential runoff into that Mississippi River system, which is less uh, nutrients into the Gulf of Mexico that's been driving uh, algal blooms and impacting the biosphere there. So it's uh, so, so know, it's part, part, part of it, yeah, So part of it is using only the fertilizer that you need and having set-asides away from waterways, mm -hmm. so to protect the water. What's, what's also amazing in this, obviously we want to get to the consumer. Kellogg's is happy. General Mills is happy. They, they've been getting some of this grain also. We're all happy. But you go talk to the farmers. They are so proud. There's this farmer, David, in, in Michigan. There's a video on, on, of him on the, on the uh, Kellogg's website talking about how proud he is to grow the food sustainably, what the, protecting the climate, protecting the soils, protecting the future of the world, and, and, and growing great food, healthy food. Sally, I'm going to put you in a slightly uncomfortable position because Eric makes a very persuasive case. People here know at the same time that Syngenta is owned by ChemChina, which mm -hmm. itself right, is a state-owned company in a country whose commitment to environmental sustainability is inconsistent. Mm -hmm. and why should we believe that Syngenta is, as Eric wants us to believe, um, at the front line, you know, in the global effort to fight climate change? Yeah, I mean, I actually would say that in many ways, um, having a deep relationship, in this case being owned by ChemChina, is a positive. This is an enormous country that's having a hard time feeding its population. It's an enormous country where people have terrible rates of asthma because of poor air quality. It's a country that has denuded its soils and polluted its soils in such a way that they're, they're dealing with a dust bowl kind of circumstance. And it desperately needs to produce its own agriculture to reduce its dependence on other places, but to feed its massive population. So in this case, I mean, it's a very efficient way of Syngenta doing work on the ground in a country that really needs it that can actually be leveraged elsewhere in the world. Self-interest is everybody's See, interest. Absolutely. In Self-interest is everybody's interest. So I don't consider it a negative. Yeah. I would consider it a positive. I mean, Eric's got to deal with challenges like intellectual property protection <laughs> and those things that you know investors care about. But from the Nature Conservancy's perspective, and we are active in China and we have done work with uh, Syngenta in China, um, this is an area of tremendous need and tremendous potential and the ability to iterate quickly and learn quickly and not be dealing with a 10 or 15 year R&D cycle is actually a, a huge positive. And we, we've got a great project together in China. It's, it's, it's amazing. As Sally said, China has not done well in agriculture over the years. They've used way too much fertilizer, old crop protection products, 
um, polluted the soils, the soils are degraded, heavy metals, problems, polluted water, so all kinds of problems. And, and there's nobody to teach the farmers how to farm and do it the right way. So what we've been doing with the support of the Nature Conservancy on, on what, what are the metrics and how do you do this, is we're setting up farmer solution centers. We call them MAP, Modern Agriculture Platform for Farmers. We now have 170 centers across China. Our goal is 1,000 within five years. And these centers bring in farmers, teach them how to farm, because they've been farming for generations, but they really don't know modern agriculture. We test their soils. Every one of these centers has a soil testing center. We test their soils and figure out how, how do we get the soil healthy again? How do we use a lot less fertilizer, get the right seed, a lot less crop protection, but the right crop protection at the right time? And we have digital tools. They all have cell phones. Most of them have smartphones. But in, in the end, and get, get them financing help them grow a great crop, and then we buy back the crop because we know it's high quality. We can sell it for a high price. They, this little farmer can't sell it for a mm -hmm. high price. So it's a total solution capability that in 160, 170 villages so far is transforming agriculture. And what the TNC is doing is, is taking the metrics. How much better is the soil? How much less greenhouse gas emissions? How much cleaner is the water? And that, that, this is going to make a major impact on China, which, is ha which as you say, has been a major environmental problem. I just, just, just say one thing, and, and I'm going to quote my former colleague, uh, Secretary of State John Kerry, when we were in the Obama administration together. He said, there is no planet B. We cannot solve right, this. Right. Do you get that? There is no planet B. We cannot solve this if we don't work across country boundaries, if we don't... Uh, Open help up. everybody right. open up, share best practices, and and uh, help all countries address this. Huge opportunities in India, India, huge opportunities throughout South America, and opportunities right here in the United States. Let's see if there are any questions from the floor. We do have questions, Eric. How realistic is organic farming with respect to producing the amount of food that we will be required to meet the needs of billions of people in the future? Want me to start? Or you... I, well, I learned a lot from you in the conversation, so I think you should take this and one. And let's try to keep it quick keep so that we can okay, move through a couple of questions. Quick. First of all, uh, organic farming is nice. It's a nice market because it's high price, and, and we sell um, a lot of seed and crop protection products, pesticides, into the organic market, and it's growing. The problem with organic is the average yields are about 35 to 40 percent lower. So you've got to have 35 to 40 percent more land to grow the same amount of food. So we either have to introduce some smart technology into organic or adopt some of the organic techniques that are really good for conventional agriculture. And so we're looking at both and trying to find ways to, to have high yields with minimum amounts of pesticides and having the seed do all it can do to protect itself, to make the plants better. And I think a couple other things I learned from you. There are pesticides, herbicides used in organic farming. It is not Actually, free more. Of that. More, okay, because it's less effective and so they right. use more product. Copper is an active ingredient. It accumulates in the soil. So I think that there is, it's oversimplified to say organic is good. It's got trade-offs and I think that's, that's part of all of our jobs is to raise awareness and, right. uh, you know, try and and uh, figure out what that sweet spot is where we can feed everybody but do it in a way that uh, hurt the planet. One of the good We're things that organic way. has though is, is, is crop rotations right. and, and things that, that, that do add. So, so yeah. let's take the best of both. <laughs> we heard earlier today about the CEO climate dialogue and the need for CEOs and business leaders on climate pol to make advancement on climate policy. What are you doing, Eric, as a CEO to make climate policy a reality in the U.S.? Well, talking a lot about it, I talk about it always openly about it as I, I believe it's the biggest challenge facing the world, the future of the world. And I know there are some that don't, don't agree with that position. I believe it. I, I'll talk openly about it. And I think our company, with the support of our owners, is behaving in that way. We we're investing aggressively. The, the $2 billion, the reach out to, to and, and strategic partnership with the TNC, other NGOs that we work with, bringing a, a, an environmentalist onto our board. I mean, we, we believe in this. Now, I got to say, we also believe it's a great business opportunity. I think there are investments like we're making in Brazil that aren't going to pay off well in, in a year, but in five years, we believe there'll be a great return. So we're willing to invest five years. 
we invest in technology that takes 10 or 15 years. So we, we believe that we're, we're vocal, we're, we're with, we, we, we sign the right, you know, we, we sign documents, we, we speak out, but most importantly, how are we acting, which I believe helps, is, is, is trying our best to help the world deal with climate change. Last question. Is there a point at which the consumer is going to start seeing that flooding and drought and climate change that you mentioned on their shelves? Are items going to start disappearing from supermarkets? Yes. I mean, if we don't address the issue that we have around climate, you're going to see scarcity. Uh, you're going to see areas that may not have been involved in agriculture be transformed to agriculture, which is going to have consequences as we clear more land and so on. There's no question. I mean, you look at uh, prices of certain crops with what happened uh, you know, in the Midwest over the course of the summer, it absolutely has an impact. And uh, so uh, Eric painted a very realistic picture. This is not theoretical. We have climate change today. It is impacting business. It's impacting food security. Uh, it's impacting people. And we haven't even talked about, you know, food security in, uh, uh, in the oceans. The other day I was asked a question, am I satisfied with the progress that we're making as a company and as an industry? My answer was absolutely not. I can't be satisfied with the progress they're making as, as a world until the CO2 emissions that keep, the, the CO2 in the atmosphere that keeps climbing starts decreasing. And, and <laughs> I'm going to indulge the audience with two quick questions to the both of you to finish it up. Uh, Eric, you promised breakthrough technology. Yes. Right? That's a risky thing to do. Breakthroughs are hard to predict. Right. So tell me, where are you confident? One thing, where are you confident Syngenta can deliver a breakthrough with this investment? We, we are going to transform agriculture in China from being massively damaging to the environment to having a positive impact on the environment. That's a big promise. And Sally, is this a scale play for the Nature Conservancy? Is Syngenta the first of many companies that you hope to sign up to this kind of partnership or at least hope to collaborate with? I would say um, Syngenta is maybe not the first of many, but is, has met the criteria for being a, a, a really credible player. We also announced not too long ago a relationship with uh, Amazon Incorporated, $100 million that they're going to invest in natural climate solutions, reforestation, and so on. Um, we are very happy to work with businesses that see us as a credible partner where we feel we can bring something to the table and they feel they can bring something as well. But I hope that we are illustrating the opportunity for many businesses to partner with those organizations, those universities, those governments where we can affect real change. Because if this isn't all hand on deck, our planet is in real trouble. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Sally Julie and Eric Byron. Thank you very much.